an analytical review of the literature on cyberbullying and harassment presented by Terence Ball. This slidecast was prepared as partial fulfillment of the course requirements for Education 6610. The purpose of this slidecast is to present an analysis of the theme of cyberbullying and harassment as it pertains to online activities. The terms cyberbullying and cyber harassment can be used interchangeably. Cyberbullying refers to the use of electronic communication tools such as cell phones, emails, or instant messaging to bully others. It is an important theme because it has many potentially harmful effects on the victim, including making them feel angry, sad, embarrassed, and afraid. Although cyberbullying is sometimes reported to peers, parents, and teachers, it often goes underreported. Cyberbullying is not restricted by age, education, location, or internet proficiency. The 15 sources that were the basis of this analysis were selected from peer-reviewed educational technology journals and all included an electronic medium. The analysis only included sources with the words cyberbullying, cyber and bullying, cyber harassment, or electronic harassment as part of the title. To figure as part of the analysis, the journal sources had to include research participants. This meant that meta-analysis and book reviews were excluded. The studies selected were published between 2005 and 2013. The number of participants in the studies ranged from 154 to 2,781. All of the studies reviewed used a quantitative approach to data collection and analysis with the exception of one study that used a mixed methods approach. The studies involved participants from 10 different countries. The participants ranged from young children to adults in the general public. Many studies looked at specific groups such as teachers, middle school students, university students, and parents. The analysis of the studies revealed six categories related to cyberbullying and harassment. The categories that emerged from the analysis were demographics, reporting, effects on students and victims, correlations between traditional and cyberbullying, associated factors, and teacher reactions. There are two groups of individuals involved in cyberbullying. These are the cyberbullies and the cyber victims. Cyberbullying and cyber victimization was found to not be restricted by gender, relationship status, culture, socioeconomic status, age, language proficiency, or educational level. It was found that 75% of participants believed that cyber bullies would receive some sort of consequence for their action if the incidents were reported to friends, parents, teachers, or the police. Relating specifically to students, 83% of them believed teachers could stop cyberbullying when informed. One of the characteristics of cyberbullying is that it is rarely disclosed. The most commonly used strategy by cyber victims was to ignore the cyberbullying. When cyber victims do report, they do so most often to peers and parents. There are a number of factors that are associated with cyberbullying and cyber victimization. In relation to internet use, it was found that location, purpose, frequency, time of day, and applications were all predictors of cyber victimization. It was also found that knowledge about cyber safety predicted cyber victimization. About 86% of cyberbullying occurred at home, with almost 63% occurring alone. Email and instant messaging were found to be the most frequently used applications through which cyberbullying occurred. The main reason that cyber bullies gave for their actions was to cause harm to others. This was done mainly out of revenge or retaliation. Other reasons given by cyber bullies for engaging in cyber bullying was for fun, for something to do, and for power. Cyber bullies also reported engaging in cyber bullying to show off their technological skills. About 94% of middle school students believe cyber bullying caused harm. This is confirmed by reports from cyber victims. Around 50% of cyber victims stated that they found the experience upsetting and 57% felt angry because of cyberbullying incidents. 
Cyberbullying also made the victims feel sad, embarrassed, hurt, afraid, and less likely to want to go to school. Between 50 to 81 percent of pre-service teachers and 65 to 72 percent of full-time teachers surveyed were concerned about cyberbullying. However, only 30 to 51 percent of pre-service teachers and 20 to 38 percent of full-time teachers felt confident in their ability to identify and manage cyberbullying problems. Over 70 percent of teachers reported that cyberbullying made them feel anxious and nearly 95 percent of them felt that anti-cyberbullying guidance was imperative. Teachers felt that cyberbullying was an important issue and should be studied by teachers and educators. The studies revealed that there was a high correlation between cyberbullying and traditional bullying. Traditional bullies were more likely to be engaged in cyberbullying than non-bullies, with about 30% of traditional bullies also being cyberbullies. Individuals that were a traditional bully were also more likely to be a cyber victim than non-bullies, with about 27% of traditional bullies also being cyber victims. There is also an eye correlation between cyber victimization and traditional victimization. Between one-third and 64% of traditional bully victims were also cyber bully victims. An analysis of the role gender played in cyberbullying and harassment revealed inconsistencies between studies. Only one study showed no gender differences. However, several studies found that girls were more likely to be cyberbullies than boys, while other studies found just the opposite. Age and education had little impact on cyber victimization. Cyberbullying and cyber victimization were found to be apparent at any age and education level. Cyber victims rarely disclosed to adults, with only about 34 to 50 percent of cyber victims having done so. When cyber victims do report, about 60 percent of them do so to peers. Several studies reported correlations between cyberbullying and traditional bullying. Similarly, a high correlation between cyber victimization and traditional victimization was found. Cyber victims and cyber bullies use the internet more frequently than non-victims and non-bullies. When cyber bullying incidents did occur, about 86 percent of them occurred at home. The internet applications used most often in cyberbullying incidents were email and instant messaging. The frequency of cyberbullying occurring anonymously ranged from 34 to 50 percent. As well, it was revealed that most cyberbullying was instigated for reasons relating to getting even. Although the studies confirmed that cyberbullying caused harm, harm was not universally reported by all cyber victims. Findings revealed that around 50% of cyber victims found the experience upsetting. The studies revealed that pre-service and full-time teachers were concerned about cyberbullying. Although the majority of teachers were concerned, less than 50% felt confident in managing cyberbullying issues. As well, although 95% of teachers felt that anti-cyberbullying guidance was an imperative, only 65 to 68% felt that cyberbullying should be studied by teachers and educators. Similarly, between 50 to 60 percent of pre-service teachers felt their training did not prepare them to manage cyberbullying. However, only about 45 percent wanted cyberbullying training at the university level, and about 20 percent did not want this type of training at all. The findings confirmed that cyberbullying and harassment did exist and that the problem was not restricted by gender, age, education, or socioeconomic status. Those who were cyber victimized suffered from a wide range of negative effects including anger, sadness, and fear. Many cyberbullying incidents go unreported. Only about 12% of parents knew their child was being cyberbullied, a fraction of what actually occurred. Reporting was made even more difficult by the fact that about 35 to 50 percent of cyberbullying occurred anonymously. What makes this underreporting even more intriguing was that 75 percent of victims and non-victims believed that cyberbullies would receive some sort of consequence for their actions. 
83% of students thought teachers could stop cyberbullying if they were aware of the problem. Yet only about 50% of teachers reported that students had complained to them of cyberbullying incidents. The implications of this analysis relate specifically to educators, students, and parents. Anti-cyberbullying programs need to be developed by educators and other professionals to help students, parents, and teachers prevent, identify, and manage cyberbullying. Although available research does provide support and direction for educators and related professionals in how to approach the cyberbullying and harassment problem, further research is needed. There are two significant concerns regarding the analysis of the 15 studies. These relate to applying findings to the general population. First, it was revealed that culture strongly influenced the nature and extent of cyberbullying and harassment. However, only two of the 15 studies investigated cultural differences amongst participants. With over half of the studies analyzed being conducted internationally, the question must be asked how the overall findings might be different if the cultural variable did not exist. Secondly, cyberbullying and cyber victimization was found at any age. However, none of the studies analyzed provided an in-depth examination of the nature and extent of cyberbullying and harassment across age groups. As well, over one-third of the studies analyzed focused specifically on students from the 11 to 14 year old age group. With a significant sampling from this age group, there are concerns when applying findings to the general population.